Well, each week we gather together and worship God in a number of different ways. We worship him through singing his praises. We worship him through the sacraments today, specifically through the sacrament of baptism. We worship him through giving. And now we worship him through attuning our ears and our hearts to the word of God. And so as we continue working our way through Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, we come today to chapter eight. I would invite you to turn with me and stand together as we read God's word. This is 2 Corinthians chapter eight, and we will begin reading in verse one where Paul writes this. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then, by the will of God, to us. Accordingly, we urge Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. Let's pray. Heavenly Fathers, we come now to worship you through our listening to your word and applying it to our lives. Lord, we pray that we would take these words as the very word of God, and that that very word of God would pour forth through the mouth of Pastor Trent as he preaches this morning, that you would give him your words to preach, that we would excel in all those things and in faith and in generosity, Lord, not by our own resources, but because of the grace of Jesus Christ showered on us. And as always, as you do a work through your word, that you would draw us into greater conformity to the example of Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray, amen. You may be seated. But perhaps you've heard it said before that when it comes to giving, some people will stop at nothing. (laughs) Which is sad, but true, right? In fact, uh, according to some studies that I had seen over the last number of years, in the United States, some 25 to 35% of Americans actually don't give anything. To anybody, I'm not just talking about the church, I'm talking about anywhere, nothing, 25 to 35%. That's kind of sad and disappointing. But before we get too down on the old red, white, and blue, you should know that Americans give twice as much as our Canadian neighbors to the north. So we got that going for us. And actually three to 15 times as much as other wealthy developed nations. So while we're not extraordinarily generous, compared to many other nations, there's actually a great deal of generosity that is happening in the U.S. When it comes to Christians, in 2017, Christians gave about 2.5% of their income to charitable causes, whether that's their church or some other organizations, 2.5%. Depending on what your measuring stick is, that may encourage you, it may depress you, Uh, but If you're feeling good about it, you should know that during the Great Depression, Christians were still giving 3.3% of their income away to others. Far cry from what we have been doing in pretty exceptionally prosperous economic times. When it comes to overall amount of giving, of course, those with the most are able to give the most. But when it comes to sacrificial giving and and giving in terms of a percentage of what one actually possesses, we often find that, of course, it is the least who give the most. Omar is one of those guys. Uh, Omar's story was told to me by uh, Dr. David Nelms of the Timothy Initiative, another one of our mission partners that we're excited to support. Their work is specifically advancing church planting in some of the hardest to reach places in the world. But David met Omar in a refugee camp in Kenya. And inside of this camp, the people who were there, the Sudanese people who were there, had basically nothing. They were fleeing from a war-torn country. 
most cases with only what they could carry or wear. And so it was a large refugee camp full of people with nothing. But Omar didn't have nothing. He had Jesus and the message of good news. And he began to share the good news of Jesus with people in this camp. And many of them came to know and trust Jesus enough that Omar actually started a church planting training center in the midst of this refugee camp. And the other refugees who became disciples of Jesus planted 12 churches amongst this refugee camp. Well, after this, Omar said, I want to go back to my home country of Sudan, and I want to start churches there. So he came to the Timothy Initiative, and he said, I want to go back and do this. And they said, Omar, you know that your country is under Sharia law, and it's not legal for you to go back and tell people about Jesus, don't you? And he said, yes, I know. He said, you know that people aren't going to be happy about this. In fact, that you might very well die if you go back there and start telling people about Jesus. And he smiled and said, I know. And so we went with, again, nothing to the Nuba region of Sudan, which was one of the most war-torn and poverty-stricken areas in an already difficult country. And he began to share the good news of Jesus. And amongst the people he ministered to, he saw many people come to know Jesus and began planting churches. And amongst this group of people who have nothing... They planted some 250 churches. Now, most of the people that Omar is ministering to in this region of Sudan, they don't actually make any money. Like not just they only make a little bit of money. They don't make money. They live off the land. And those very few people who actually have an income, it's usually less than a dollar or two a day. Despite the fact that these believers have nothing, they have managed to find a way to care for more than 50 orphans and 60 widows. They don't have anything themselves, and yet they're going beyond their own ability to care for people who manage to have even less than they themselves. When an opportunity came for them to support the advance of the gospel to areas around them, these believers who, again, don't actually have money, managed to come up with $217 to give to the cause of planting churches around them. It sounds like nothing to us, but to them, this is a pile of gold. He's been robbed. He's been threatened with death. He's been in danger of his life many different times, persecuted every which way from Sunday. Yet when David thinks about this man, the one word that comes to his mind is joy. He's a man that has nothing except Jesus and an abundance of joy and an extremely perilous situation fraught with affliction. And in this way, he's very similar to the believers that Paul is talking about here in 2 Corinthians 8, the Macedonians. The Macedonian Christians were in deep affliction, and yet from the Apostle Paul, they heard about a project that he was working on. You see, many miles away in Jerusalem, there was a famine taking place, and their Jewish Christian brothers and sisters in Jerusalem were starving. And so Paul had taken it upon himself to travel amongst the Gentile churches to take up a collection, a what we would call essentially deacons fund kind mercy ministry money that could be delivered to the churches in Jerusalem for their brothers and sisters in Christ. Well, the Macedonians don't have anything, but they want to participate. And Paul, in this section is telling the Corinthians about the Macedonians' generosity as an encouragement to them to be prepared to give when he gets there because he's on his way. And in preparing them to give, he writes two chapters in Scripture that are probably the most significant and astounding teaching on giving that we will find anywhere. And so that's what we're going to be looking at today. I do want to tell you, even as we're about to talk about giving over the next several weeks, we are not entering a new capital campaign. (laughs) You'll be glad to know. And it's not even as though our budget is in bad shape. You have been extraordinarily generous and God is blessing his church. We're not trying to raise money today. We're trying to set you free to experience the joy of generosity as the Bible lays it out with no agenda. So just receive this as God's word. Here's the principle I want you to come away with today. 
It's this, the more we joyfully grasp the grace of God given to us, the more we will joyfully release in giving to others. The tighter grasp you take hold of the grace that you've already been given, the more your grasp will loosen up on everything else that you've been given. And that's a recipe for great joy and blessing of many others in Jesus' name and the advance of the kingdom and everything else. So let's talk about the source of generosity, the shape of generosity, and finally the summons to generosity. I want you to look with me in chapter 7, verse 16 first, because this, of course, helps us understand where Paul is coming from. You remember last week he was uh, celebrating the fact that they had felt godly sorrow that led to true repentance. And Paul says then in verse 16 of chapter 7, I have complete confidence in you. And what he's talking about is the fact that these believers who had been estranged from Paul because they sidled up with the false apostles who had slipped into Corinth, Paul is convinced they are, that the majority of them have repented of that association, that unholy union, and that they are once again aligned with him. He has complete confidence in that. And that confidence is going to express itself, their repentance is going to express itself by partnering with Paul in this collection they're taking up for the people in Jerusalem. You see, they had already been planning on doing this a year before this. But when the false apostles slipped in and they got sideways with the apostle Paul, they stopped preparing to give to the brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. And now Paul is convinced of their repentance and that's going to be made evident when they join in the collection that he's about to come and take. So with that by way of background, he says in chapter eight, verse one, we want you to know brothers about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. Now Macedonia here refers to uh, Greece, modern day Greece and the churches that he would be referring to would be churches like the one in Philippi, Berea and Thessalonica. So churches that you're probably familiar with if you have read the Bible some. So he says, there has been a grace given by God among these churches. And the way that Paul knows that is because this grace has expressed itself in a way that is observable. There's something, something tangible has happened in this community as a result of God's grace. And he tells us in verse two, for in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. A severe test of affliction. The churches in Macedonia were likely experiencing persecution, which resulted in them being in pretty dire financial circumstances. Perhaps their businesses were, were taken from them, uh, or they, their, their homes were maybe confiscated. We're not sure exactly what the nature of it was, but it put them in financial straits. And he says, in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy. You, if you think about those two phrases, it might be hard to reconcile a severe test of affliction and an abundance of joy. But actually, this is a perfectly understandable condition when you know the Christian situation. You see, to be a Christian means, uh, among other things, that the source of your joy in this world is not in anything outside of you. It's not in anything related to your circumstances. It doesn't have anything to do with how wealthy you are, how healthy you are, how well the government's treating you, how good the news or the stock market is. You, your joy is actually not based on any one of those things. If, if you're a Christian, the source of your joy is actually coming from the inside. And it makes its way out into the world in a number of different expressions. But, but Christian joy exists in the midst of severe afflictions. I want to encourage you with that. Those of you who are in the midst of affliction today, that does not mean you can't have joy. Your joy is the gift of God given to you in Jesus by the Holy Spirit who is living inside of you. Even now, in the midst of grief, you can rejoice, the Bible tells us. 
So here we have these believers in a severe test of affliction, and they're marked by their abundance of joy. Now, there's a second component that is added to this. He says, their extreme poverty. Wait, so they're super joyful in a severe test of affliction, being persecuted, and they're super poor. It doesn't add up, right? This is what grace does. It changes people. It doesn't necessarily change circumstances, but it changes people. And it's changed these people so that they're in the midst of persecution, they're super poor, and they're full of joy. How poor are they? It's hard for us to imagine what extreme poverty looks like in 21st century America where we live, but if you've had a chance to travel to some of the majority world, perhaps you have seen what extreme poverty looks like. Paul uses an adjective to describe the depth of their poverty in another place as well, Romans chapter 11, where he says, oh, the depth, that's the same word translated as extreme to describe their poverty. He says, oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How deep is their poverty? It's the same adjective he uses to describe the depth of God's wisdom and knowledge. In other words, it's really deep. They're in a really bad spot financially. So you've got a severe test of affliction. You've got an abundance of joy. You've got extreme poverty. And there's one more ingredient added to this mix, and that is the grace of God. He says, I want you to know about the grace of God that has been given among the churches in Macedonia. And the effect of these three things joining together in one place in the hearts of these Macedonian Christians is that it has overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. God's grace is able to turn extreme poverty into a joyful wealth of generosity. Not just generosity with money, but generosity with time and influence, a willingness to give yourself for others, to be a part of things like better families, as we heard about today. That was a form of generosity that that man was giving to this other man. Paul says, when you combine the grace of God, even with affliction and poverty and joy, it overflows and to a wealth of generosity. Well, I have something for the kids who are here still with us in the service. I want you all to pay special attention to this because I want you to see how these elements combine to produce an overflow of generosity. So we have here a severe test of affliction. This is the world in which these Macedonians were living in. Severe test of affliction, persecution and hardship all around. And into this Severe test of affliction, we add the, the joy of these Christians rooted in their relationship with Jesus. And they potentially had a little bit of resource, so we'll just add some of their extreme poverty to this mix. And as it stands, what you just have are a joyful poor people. But when God adds his grace, Whoa, <laughs> it overflows into a wealth of generosity. <laughs> that's, what, that's what grace does to the little bit that you have. God causes it to, to superabound and to overflow in, in generosity. And the way the Bible defines that is, is a sin, simple, sincere goodness, which gives itself without reserve and with no strings attached. That's what the grace of God does in the heart of a Christian. Whether you have a lot or a little, he causes what you have to overflow with a simple and sincere goodness that gives itself without reservation and with no strings attached. That's what we see happening in the lives of these Macedonian Christians. If you remember the story of Jesus, when the little boy comes and brings him just a couple of loaves and fishes to feed thousands of people, it's not enough. But the grace of God added to it in the hands of Jesus, that little tiny bit, it super abounds and is able to feed everybody. There was more than enough. So I want you to know today, you may not have much, but the source of your generosity is not in you. It is the grace of God at work in you. 
causing whatever you have to abound and overflow. Well, let's talk about the shape their generosity takes. The grace of God at work in them, first of all, we see that God's grace for them and for us, God's grace empowers sacrificial giving. Look with me at verse three. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord. They gave according to their means and beyond their means of their own accord. In other words, it was their decision, their choice, to give according to their means, which essentially is nothing. And so for them to give puts them beyond their ability, beyond their power. This is an extraordinary kind of generosity because uh, we assume the Apostle Paul did not even ask them to be a part of the collection. He got to the churches in Macedonia, presumably knew them already, but he could see they're extremely poor. He certainly didn't ask them for a sacrificial gift for these brothers and sisters in Jerusalem, and yet when they hear about the collection, they want to be a part of it. And to be a part of it required a sacrificial gift. The interesting thing about sacrificial giving is You can't guilt somebody into giving sacrificially. Uh, We can guilt you into giving enough to where we stop guilting you, (laughs) right? You know there's a point at which time you can give enough that somebody will stop asking you. But if you're going to give sacrificially, that doesn't arise from guilt. That actually arises from grace, These believers weren't giving because they had to. They were giving because they wanted to in response to what God had done for them. And it led them to giving beyond their ability to do so. You see, there are essentially two kinds of givers. There are people who get what they need and then they get what they want. And then if they have something left, they give it or some portion of it. On the other side are people who commit to be generous and to give, and then they figure out how they're going to live off of what's left. Andy Stanley says, the problem with giving leftovers is that your generosity can never exceed your ability to meet your own needs. If you're only ever giving after you've taken care of all of the rest of your budget and desires, you'll never be able to give beyond your ability. And God actually invites us to give beyond our ability. Now, Paul will say later, it's not required that you give to the point that you're burdened. We'll see that next week. But that's what grace prompted in these people. They actually gave to the point where they themselves were actually burdened to benefit believers many miles away that they would never see, never meet, not even ever see a photograph of. Such was the power of the grace of God at work in their life. They actually wanted to give sacrificially. That's what grace does in our lives. It moves us beyond giving according to our ability to even starting to move beyond. I wonder, have you ever experienced the joy of giving beyond your ability? The more you have, the harder it is. But have you ever experienced, see what happens when you go beyond your ability is you experience weakness because you can't, you now can't take care of yourself. That's what weakness is. And what happens when you give beyond your ability is that in the midst of that weakness, the strength of God shows up in ways that you never would have imagined or anticipated. But you never get to discover that if you only ever give from the leftovers. There is a joy in giving at any level, but there is an adventure in giving that happens when you go beyond what you think you can do. And the adventure is you get to seek God you get to see him show up in his strength in a way that you won't if you don't trust him and step out. It's not a compulsion. You're not compelled to do that. It's an invitation. 
He invites you to step out beyond your ability and trust him with your giving and watch how he provides for you. I've known lots of people who give. I did the focus of my doctoral research specifically on, on giving, things related to giving. And after talking to many people, I've never yet one time talked to a person who gave sacrificially and beyond their means and regretted it. That's not a coincidence. That is the power of God at work in the weakness of people who trust them. Every single time, if you haven't taken a giving adventure, again, I'm not even asking, we don't have a giving adventure here right now. <laughs> there are things you can give to for sure, and we encourage you to do that, but I want it for you. I want you to see God at work in your life in ways that you haven't seen yet. Second thing we see is that God's grace empowers eager giving. The Macedonians, as a result of the grace of God at work in them, we read in verse four, were begging earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. The word for favor here is grace. They were begging for the grace the gift to be able to give. Now, when we think about fundraising, it, we think about it in terms of somebody like me stands in front of people like you and I beg you to give to what we're doing. This is what it looks like when grace is at work, is that the people are begging to give. And people, mind you, who don't actually have anything but what little they have, they are begging to give. See, God's grace is involved in every phase of this equation. It is God's grace to have something to give. It's God's grace to actually have a desire to give. It's God's grace to have an opportunity to give. Do you see opportunities to give as God's grace come to you? That's exactly how the Macedonians perceived this situation. They were begging, don't let us, don't keep us from being a part of this joy of giving to these brothers and sisters that we're never going to meet. We want to be a part of it. How much does this reflect your own heart when it comes to, to giving? Finally, God's grace empowers self-giving. Verse five, this not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. So he's not talking about necessarily the, the sequence of how this happened, but he's talking about by order of priority, the f of, of, of first importance, these brothers and sisters gave themselves wholly to the Lord. They were fully surrendered to them. They, in other words, they acknowledged what the scripture says, which is you're not your own. You were bought with a price. They embraced that reality and gave themselves wholly to the Lord who bought them. And after having given themselves to the Lord who bought them, they were now fully at his disposal to do whatever he put before them to do with whatever they had to do it. Have you given yourself fully to the Lord? It was one of the Wesley brothers, I can't remember which one, but said that essentially the last part of a man to be converted is his wallet. You'll know that you've fully given yourself over to the Lord when you've given him control of your wallet. You see, for the Corinthians, or the Macedonians, it was simple. They understood God had everything. He, he bought all of them, and that included the resources that he had entrusted to them. So, so everything was already his. Now it's just a matter of how, how's it to be dispersed. Some of you have set up foundations or you're familiar with foundations and, and essentially it means you've taken a, a, a chunk of money and you've, you've, you've already donated it to this foundation. It's already signed over and now it's just a matter of deciding where it goes. Well, think of your life that way. It's all been given over to God. It's already his and now it's just a matter of deciding where to allocate what he has entrusted to you, not only financially, but your time and your gifts and your, your influence. It's already all his. He graciously allows us to write some checks to ourselves. But our joy is to see how much of it we can direct toward his purposes. You see your stuff, your money, your life 
as his? What is it that makes this difficult for us? Why is this so hard? I think John Calvin puts his finger on it when he said many years ago, because it's the same issue. He said, for what makes us more close-handed than we ought to be is when we look too carefully and too far forward in contemplating the dangers that may occur. Anybody been there? You're just thinking, you know, well, we might need this down the road. We, you know, this could happen. And, and we find ourselves starting to keep more and more back for ourselves. He says, when we are excessively cautious and careful, when we calculate too narrowly what we will require during our whole life, or in fine, how much we lose when the smallest portion is given away. In other words, this is not the financial advice your financial advisor would give you. But this is the advice that your Father in heaven who loves you gives you, which is get a little reckless. Maybe don't have a provision for every eventuality that could ever happen in your life. Maybe in a few areas, just decide that should this occur, I'm going to trust my Father in heaven. And, and what I'm giving, I'm not, I'm not just going to spend it on myself living recklessly that way, but I'm going to give it for his purposes. It's an adventure. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not compelling you, not even trying to get you. I'm inviting you to just see what he'll do if you'll trust him that way. We hold back because we're afraid. We begin to live like people who don't have a father in heaven who loves them and has promised to take care of them. We essentially live like orphans in the world who have to look out for themselves. And how much must it break God's heart when he sees his children living like orphans? When our father has said, he didn't just imply, he has flat out told us and promised us, I know what you need. And do you think I don't care for you? That I will not take care of you? We are invited to trust him. Henri Nouwen writes, every time I take a step in the direction of generosity, I know that I'm moving from fear to love. Every time you let go a little bit of that tight grip on whatever it is you're holding on to, time, money, resource, whatever, you're moving from fear because you're trusting him. And you're moving toward love for him and for others. It's an invitation to loosen up our fearful grip, to move out in love and trust. Generosity ultimately is not a reflection of how much you've been given. It's a reflection of how much you have given yourself to him who gave himself for you. Do you trust him? Finally, the summons to generosity. Verse six. Accordingly, we urged Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. He's referring to the collection. Titus had already a year before started. They were starting to put money away for Paul when he got there to pick it up and then take it to Jerusalem. The work shut down and now he sent Titus ahead of him again with this letter to help them get ready to make sure they complete this act of grace that they had begun, to be generous as they had intended to do. And then he says this in verse seven, which is a word specifically for them. He says, but as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. The Corinthian church, as you may be aware, prided itself on its spiritual graces and gifts. They excelled in all the spiritual gifts. As we read 1 Corinthians, we see that, that every gift God has, seems to have ever given was manifested amongst the Corinthian church. And Paul says, just as you've excelled in all of these other graces, and even as you excel in how much we love you, add this to the list. Generosity. Giving. Giving. 
this grace. Make sure you're not lacking in this one because this comes back to what he told them in 1 Corinthians 13. This is love. You see, you can give away all that you have and do so without love, but he wants them to excel in the grace of giving that was manifested amongst the Macedonians. The kind of giving that flows from love for God and for others. Do you aspire to excel in the grace of generosity? As you think about different aspects of the Christian life, is this something that's a part of your own prayer time? Lord, today, would you help me to hold on less tightly to my stuff? And would you give me an opportunity today to give of what I have to somebody else? Do you aspire to excel in the grace of giving? We're afraid of this, aren't we? <laughs> if we're honest, probably not many of us are praying that way, unless you've experienced the, what happens when you do. I, you know, it's, it's probably the second least popular gift after celibacy, the one that nobody wants, right, is, is the gift of giving. But what a gift it is. We should, as much as we long for all of the other spiritual gifts and graces, we should long for and pray that God will give us this gift as well. There are some of you here maybe who do excel in giving, but it may be for the wrong reasons. You may excel in giving because you believe that by giving, you may be making up for a lot of mistakes that you've made in your life. Maybe even making up for how you made the money that you're giving away. And you're hoping that by giving, you might somehow earn the grace and favor of God. And I just want you to know that that is a dead end street. See, generosity can't be a means of earning grace from the Lord because it is in itself a product of grace. The reason why you're giving is a result of grace. It can't earn grace. It's the, it's the effect of grace. We give because he first gave to us. Now, you may not be a Christian. And you're saying, what do you mean it's grace in my life? I don't even buy into this Christian stuff. Well, the fact of the matter is, you were made in the image of your creator. He made you to be like him. And you're not like him in a lot of ways. And I'm not either. That's part of what being a part of the church is about, is becoming more like him. But in your generosity, you reflect the Father, the God who made you. And I want to encourage that in you. And I want you to look to the source of where that came from. That came from the God who so loved the world that he gave. And he gave his son for you to be reconciled to him. You see, you couldn't have peace with God unless somebody dealt with your sin. And God gave his son to pay the price for your sin so that you could be reconciled to him. So that you could have a father in heaven and you could actually explore the further boundaries of generosity than you've even explored to this point. As you trust your father who's in heaven to provide for your every need. For those of you who are Christians today, let us remember the grace that God has already given us in giving us his son. If he would give us Jesus when we were sinners and when we hated him, if he's that kind of generous, can we not trust him? to step out in faith just a little further perhaps toward the boundaries of our own abilities and trust that he's going to provide for us as we give graciously in his name for what we've been given. That's my prayer for myself. It's my prayer for you. Let's pray to that end together. Lord, we praise you that your grace is enough. No matter whether we have a lot today or a little your grace is enough to cause us to overflow with generosity toward others. I pray this morning that we, each one, would take hold of the grace you have given us when you gave us Jesus, for that is your grace, your son. That we would take hold of him and knowing that in him we have everything, that we would, that we would loosen our grip on our things. And that we would be even eager, even begging for opportunities to give in your name for your glory out of love for you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.